Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this session of the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute's research webinar series. My name is Shaisa Malik. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Integrative Health and the Executive Director of the Samueli Institute. Before we start, I just want to review a few Zoom housekeeping items. Um, you may have noticed the sessions being recorded, and we'll send all registrants a link to this recording and we'll post the link on the event uh, webpage. Um, everyone will remain mute to limit distractions, but really these are interactive, so please communicate with us. Um, submit any questions in the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to um, you know, as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. The Samuel Institute, as you may know, is committed to whole person health research education and clinical care. And our interdisciplinary researchers are dedicated to exploring the science of disease prevention and treatment. And so this research webinar series uh, features our Samuel A. Scholars, our pilot uh, studies grant awardees, and there's a cur currently there's a cycle going on. So please uh, look into that and see if you're interested in applying for one of our pilot awards. Um, and then, of course, it also features our very distinguished Samueli Endowed Chairs. And so um, today, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Harris, uh, Susan and Henry Samueli Endowed Chair in the School of Medicine. He joined uh, our institute um, a, a few months ago, last year in 2023. And he's also a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Care. He comes to UCI from the University of Michigan, where he was a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and in Internal Medicine. His background is in basic science and clinical research in integrative medicine. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Genetics from Purdue University and his PhD in molecular and cell biology from UC Berkeley. He's also um, a clinician. He's a graduate of the Maryland Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine and received a master's in clinical research design and statistical analyses at the University of Michigan. Um, he is a world-renowned researcher in acupuncture and also the co-president of the Society of Acupuncture Research, uh, or SAR, and a past member of the Advisory Council for the NIH uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, so the NCCIH. Um, he's currently investigating the neurobiological mechanisms of both pharmacological and non-pharmacologic uh, treatments for chronic pain and fatigue conditions. His recent investigations have focused on the role of brain neurotransmitters and their receptors in human and uh, humans with chronic pain. And he continues his uh, amazing line of research at UCI. Uh, please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Harris. Thank you very much, Dr. Malik. Um, that was a very kind introduction, and I'm so happy to be with you all today to tell you about some of the research that uh, I've been doing at Michigan, as well as what I'm continuing to do here at UC Irvine. Um, the title of my talk is Acupuncture and Acupressure for Chronic Pain. So um, I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, to declare uh, for, this, for the content uh, of this presentation today. So as many of you might know, uh, chronic pain is very prevalent in our society. There's actually more people living with chronic pain in the United States than those individuals that have cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. So it's about 116 million individuals with chronic pain in the United States, which ends up being about one in five. So it's a very prevalent condition and um, it's also very costly. Um, the annual cost for uh, treating individuals with chronic pain, which includes money for lost work, medical treatments, et cetera, um, is on the order of $635 billion annually that 
cost the U.S. Uh, for this condition. So it's really, really needed to be studied more thoroughly and coming up with better types of treatments for pain. Now, um, this is what we think of pain uh, in general, and this is what typically people think of when they think of pain. So we've all uh, experienced burns, most likely, where we put our finger maybe above a candle flame, and that excites uh, a nerve cell that's uh, cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion, and then that information goes in to the spinal cord, and then it's transmitted up into the brain, where there's areas of the brain that are involved in perceiving uh, that sensation. So there, those areas continue or contain structures like the insula, the amygdala, the cingulate, the somatosensory cortex S1, which we'll talk about uh, later today, um, as well as the secondary somatosensory cortex S2. So these brain areas are really where pain is perceived. Um, without those areas in the brain, uh, you would not have that pain sensation. Um, and then in addition to the ascending pathway, there's also this descending pathway where um, the brain can send signals down uh, through the midbrain into the spinal column to inhibit the transmission of pain signals that are ascending. So there's both ascending and descending pathways that regulate pain, and it's the combined action of these two sort of yin and yang uh, pathways uh, that really determine uh, what type of pain you might be experiencing. So um, the type of pain that we're talking about where we're basically kind of burning our finger or if we hit our hammer, if we hit our finger with a hammer, um, that type of pain is called nociceptive pain. And we've all experienced uh, some degree of nociceptive pain. And it's usually due to inflammation uh, or tissue damage of specific neurons, which are called nociceptors, which signal for that pain. Um, it's usually well localized and the type of treatments that you get for that type of pain can include things like NSAIDs, injections, surgeries, uh, maybe opioids, and the types of chronic pain patients that you see with nociceptive pain. We usually think of things like knee osteoarthritis, so knee inflammation uh, or autoimmune, autoimmune disorders or cancer pain. So that's, that's nociceptive pain, but there's two other types of pain that can happen and uh, they're a little less understood. One of them is called neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is essentially when you have nerve damage to uh, either in the periphery or in the central nervous system that then causes a disruption of information and that then leads to things like pain and as well as numbness and tingling. You may have a family member or a friend that maybe has uh, diabetes. So diabetic peripheral neuropathy is common, commonly seen. Um, sciatica is another condition that's neuropathic. So like pinching of the spinal nerve um, and then also carpal tunnel syndrome. And um, the types of treatments that we use for neuropathic pain involve things like nerve blocks or CNS acting drugs. Now the third type of pain, which you may have not heard much about is called nosoplastic pain. And this is a new type of pain pathway that's really just been gaining attention in the last 10 years or so. And what we found is that the nosoplastic condition is arising, nosoplastic pain is arising from altered central nervous system function. And um, it's almost like turning up the gain on your amplifier uh, when you're playing your guitar. So the, the analogy kind of goes like, um, if you want your guitar to play louder, you, you can strum the strings louder. That would be like a nociceptive or peripheral pathway, but you can also turn up the gain on the amplifier and that can turn up the gain on the pain signal, and that's called uh, nosoplastic pain. One of the conditions that we'll talk about today is fibromyalgia, which is a common uh, cardinal nosoplastic pain condition. And there's definitely a lot of other conditions like irritable bowel and tension headache and interstitial cystitis, which then can cause nosoplastic pain. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good treatments, but there are some drugs and non-pharmacological therapies that we'll talk about. What's interesting and what's complex is that any one individual patient with pain may have varying degrees of all three of these types of pain going on. They may have nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, as well as nosoplastic pain, all going on at the same time in the patient. And it's the clinician's job to try to understand how, how to treat that patient. And uh, it's the researcher's job to try to study it more. 
So um, integrative medicine is one of the main treatments that's becoming more and more prevalent for treating pain. And it's no surprise that many individuals with pain seek out integrative therapies, either as a last resort or um, because they don't feel like taking a drug or doing a surgery for their pain. So it's, it's a nice option to use integrative therapies. There's a number of integrative therapies that are available, and we're going to talk today about acupuncture and acupressure, but there's obviously other things like meditation, yoga, tai chi, uh, qigong, um, as well as herbal supplements as well. One question you might have is how commonly are these treatments used? And I wanna highlight this paper that just came out in JAMA last month. And this is a paper by Richard Nahan from uh, NIH. And what his group did was he basically chronicled the use of integrative therapies from 2002 to 2012 to 2022. So it's over a span of 20 years. And what's amazing is that in that span of 20 years, there was an increase from 19% to 36% of individuals in the US using some form of integrative therapy. So almost a doubling. And in 2012, um, people were paying in the US out of pocket on the order of $28 billion uh, for visits to integrative practitioners. That's about 10% of the total out-of-pocket healthcare expenses for individuals in the US. Um, so you can see here, acupuncture is increasing a bit. It's kind of on the low end here, we've got 1% of the people using it in 2002 and 2% using it in 2022. Um, it, interestingly, meditation does this huge jump from you know 8% all the way to 17% and yoga does a nice increase, but all of these therapies are significantly uh, increasing in their prevalence and usage uh, over those years. What about for pain patients? Well, for pain patients, many of them seek out acupuncture. Here we see uh, the data on, uh, on those years. For acupuncture, there was kind of stable for the first decade, but then between 2012 and 2022, we have a nice increase from about 55% to 73% of individuals using uh, acupuncture for their pain care. Um, and this may be because of increased insurance coverage, Medicare and Medicaid is covering acupuncture for low back pain. Um, but there's also been a lot more interesting studies that have been more impactful, and it's becoming more and more common to see uh, acupuncture research articles uh, in the press. And this is chronicling uh, the rise of acupuncture research. So if you look at the publication year on the x-axis and the number of publications on the y-axis, you can see that acupuncture is definitely increasing over the last couple decades, uh, whereas um, uh, conventional biomedicine is, is not increasing as much. So there's definitely an increase in research as well uh, using uh, acupuncture. I like this slide um, because this is an article that was done way back in 1984 by Dr. Donald Price. He was a, a pioneer in the pain field. And what he did was he gave uh, acupuncture to low back pain patients and then just followed them for uh, days for like a couple of weeks after they got treated. So on the Y axis, what he's plotting is the pain of a low back pain patient, an average of 12 patients. So their pain is averaging about seven out of 10 uh, on, a, on a visual analog scale. And then after acupuncture, there's this sharp drop in pain. Um, and then the needles are removed. Okay, so now the needles are no longer there, and then he's just tracking their pain. And you can see that the pain stays down. It stays very low for, you know, the first day, and then just slowly, gradually creeps back over the next two weeks. So you can see that this is a very complex intervention. Even though the needles were just inserted back here at baseline, there's this temporal dynamic of, of analgesia or pain reduction that's really going on even after the needles are removed. Uh, so I think that's really exciting. And so some of the key questions we wanna ask about acupuncture are, you know, first of all, does it work? And okay, so if it does work, um, how does it work? So to the answer the first question about how acupuncture does it work, um, I'm always compelled to talk about this acupuncture trialist collaborative study that looked at two different questions, whether acupuncture was better than standard of care or usual care versus whether acupuncture was better than sham acupuncture or placebo. And this was a huge compilation of patients. So it was arising from 
over 29 different trials with almost 18,000 patients, so very well powered. Um, 20 trials involved sham controls, which involved 5,230 patients, and 18 of the trials had the non-acupuncture controls, which was comparing to like usual care or no treatment, and that had uh, almost uh, 14,600 patients. So what did they find? Well, they found that acupuncture was better than no treatment. Um, when they compared acupuncture versus non-acupuncture controls for migraine, osteoarthritis of the knee and hip, and then low back pain and neck pain, um, they had an effect size of 0.42 to 0.57. That effect size is moderate. I mean, that's a significant effect size. It's essentially a taking someone's pain from an eight out of 10 down to maybe a five out of 10 uh, on average. Some people are getting much better and some people get uh, a little bit less analgesia. What's striking though, is when you look at the sham controls um, where you're not changing the actual acupuncture treatment, you're only changing what you're comparing acupuncture to, um, we see that the effect size uh, is, is definitely reduced down to 0.15 to 0.23, which is more of a a small effect size, highly statistically significant. All the p-values are less than 0.001, but clinically uh, a little bit less impactful. For reference, let's look at some drugs. So if you if you have knee osteoarthritis and you take an NSAID for it, um, you might be surprised to know that the effect size for that NSAID is 0.15 to 0.2. So on par with acupuncture versus placebo acupuncture. Um, and then for fibromyalgia, we have things like pregabalin, which is an FDA approved drug. And its effect size is really just 0.25 to 0.3. So it's also on the low end. So acupuncture is um, just as effective as some medications for uh, reducing pain. Interestingly, um, when you look in the brain, so these are uh, fMRI studies. It's a, a compiled meta-analysis looking at how individuals' brains respond when they get acupuncture needles inserted in their acupuncture points. And you just look in the brain to see where it's activated. You see these red and orange areas that are activated when the acupuncture needle is inserted and manipulated. Whereas for sham acupuncture, um, it's the blue areas. Um, but look, the overlap is green. So you can see there's some areas like the insula here, which uh, only respond to real acupuncture whereas the thalamus here gets this bilateral activation of both real and sham acupuncture. So essentially what we're doing is the sham treatment is activating some of the very same brain regions that the real treatment is activating. So that means that the two interventions are overlapping and that might be why um, the effect size is somewhat reduced with, with sham. So we wanted to do a we wanted to do a study to see what the somatosensory afference was, and so somatosensory afference is the sensation of the needling as it goes into the body, into the spinal column. The nerve activity goes up into the brain, and then you get uh, changes in brain activity. We wanted to see how somatosensory afference was playing out in the acupuncture treatment, and so specifically to do this, we wanted to compare. Um, acupuncture that had a lot of somatosensory afferents with a sham control that had none. So that would have to be somebody that thought they were getting acupuncture, but they didn't feel anything at all from the treatment. So how can you do that? So um, Ishjayak Maula was a grad student in my group, and he analyzed these data where we collected fibromyalgia patients that were randomized to either receive electroacupuncture where they got needling, uh, do 20 ear shin men, and then electroacupuncture from large intestine 11 to four, as well as bilaterally to stomach 36, and then also gallbladder 34 to spleen six, as well as manual acupuncture on liver three. So this group had a very strong somatosensory component to their intervention. The control we decided to use was mock laser. So we just told the patients, hey, you're going to get a laser treatment. The laser is going to be shining on your body and that's going to stimulate the points and that's going to be the acupuncture that you receive. It's kind of a new, new way of doing acupuncture. But what we did was we actually turned the laser off. So they didn't get any stimulation whatsoever. And so our IRB allowed us to do that. And um, we did that. 
So uh, what did it look like in terms of their pain at plotting the pain level on the y-axis here and then before and after treatment? You can see the electroacupuncture group gets a decrease in their pain. The, the mock laser group also gets a decrease in their pain, but it's uh, much less significant. It's more significant with electroacupuncture. And then if you plot the mass index, which is the sensory uh, sensation of the needling, you can see that the electroacupuncture group over all the treatments shows this nice uh, sensory component. They're sensing the needling, whereas the mock laser group uh, had much less. So we were successful in engendering uh, an acupuncture treatment that had somatosensory afferents, whereas the control group had very little. So this is what happened when Ishtiak looked in the brains to see what's happening in these individuals as you know before and after they get treatment. He decided to put seeds in the bilateral uh, somatosensory cortex. Remember, this is one of those brain areas that's activated in pain. And so um, because there was a lot of acupuncture being done on the leg, he decided to put seeds in the leg area of the somatosensory cortex. And he found that areas like the insula, the anterior insula and the posterior insula showed increasing connectivity to this S1 leg area. And in the mock laser group, he saw, he saw nothing of that going on. And if anything, he saw somewhat of a, a decrease in that connectivity. So there was a different effect in the brain uh, with which different areas were being connected uh, with acupuncture. And it was related to pain in such a way that when individuals saw greater increases in their S1 to insula connectivity, they showed greater decreases in their clinical pain. So that meant that this connectivity increase that we were seeing was related to the clinical action uh, of that electroacupuncture. We also did a couple of other scans. Uh, one of them was a structure, uh, was a uh, neurochemical scan, which is called proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And instead of getting an image of the brain, you basically place a box uh, in, in the image and you try to assess what the chemicals are inside of that box, looking at the, the resonance of protons. And so with that technique, you can get a spectra like this. And this peak right here, highly reproducible peak, is the GABA peak. It's the brain's main uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So when you have more GABA around, the nerve cells tend to be less activated. And what Ischiak found was that GABA signal in the anterior insula was coming in the same area where we were seeing increased connectivity with electroacupuncture. And what he found was that as that S1 to insula connectivity was increasing, GABA was also increasing in the anterior insula. And when GABA was increasing, he also found a decrease in their clinical pain. So essentially this story has three pieces. We have, um, we have Somatosensory afferents in the S1 leg area showing connectivity to the anterior insula. So this connectivity is increasing. We see insula activity of GABA to be increasing as well. And we have less pain. And what Ischiak was able to found was that there was this mediation effect where the effect of the connectivity that was elicited by the acupuncture on reducing pain was mediated almost entirely by GABA in the anterior insula. So again, uh, electrical acupuncture on the leg increases the connectivity of the S1 area to the insula, and that results in an increase in GABA and uh, then subsequent reductions in clinical pain. So that was a nice, nice story, and it supports that real acupuncture is doing something and that the somatosensory component of the acupuncture is important. It's an important con Com composition part of uh, this intervention. We had previously done a study in fibromyalgia patients as well, where we found that GABA was lower uh, in the anterior insula. So this is just taking fibromyalgia patients at rest. We found that their GABA was lower uh, in, in those individuals and the individuals with, with less GABA showed uh, more clinical pain. And then furthermore, when Chris Watson uh, in at Michigan looked at animals, simply just looking at rats and reducing the amount of um, GABA in the insula pharmacologically, uh, he was able to show that just simply reducing GABA in the insula of rodents caused a reduction in their pain threshold, which means they got more painful. 
they got more sensitive to the pain. So that means that GABA is playing a role uh, in pain, even without acupuncture being involved. So um, I'd like to shift to talk a little bit now about acupressure. So one of the problems with acupuncture is that you have to always go to the therapist or the acupuncturist to get your treatment. What we've been interested in is looking at a treatment that can be accessible by anybody uh, who has access to either a phone or a computer um, or a video uh, monitor of some sort. And that technique is called acupressure and we've called it self acupressure. So basically this is when individuals, uh, instead of stimulating the point with a needle, you stimulate it with your finger by adding pressure. It's nice that it's essentially free. I mean, once you learn how to do this, you can, you don't have to pay an acupuncturist to get that treatment. Um, it requires minimal instruction. It's only about a 15 minute training. Um, once you've learned how to do this, you completely control the dose, how strong you apply pressure, as well as how often you apply pressure. So that empowers the patient to be more in control of their, of their symptoms. It also reduces the practitioner burden, which means that the practitioners don't have to uh, always see patients. And um, obviously it's available and um, all more, more readily available. And vulnerable groups like elderly and children um, have respond better to, to acupressure than they do to needling. We've actually have uh, created a couple of apps, which I'll talk about in a second, which are freely available on iPhones and Androids. So Dr. Susie Zick and I at University of Michigan, we did a clinical trial of acupressure in breast cancer survivors. So one of the thing about cancer survivors is that they've survived the cancer, but many of them go on to develop pain and fatigue and sleep problems and whatnot. And so we decided to do a clinical trial where we randomized uh, fatigued cancer survivors to receive either relaxing acupressure, which was designed to improve sleep uh, in individuals or stimulating acupressure, which was designed to make them more awake during the day, or um, they were randomized to usual care where they just kept doing the same things uh, that they normally did for their fatigue. And they completed uh, daily acupressure treatments for over six weeks, and then we had a four-week washout. And interestingly, when we look at the fatigue score here on the y-axis, uh, this shaded uh, gray area basically just means the levels of fatigues that people normally have uh, if they're not if they don't have chronic uh, fatigue. This is just normal fatigue. Um, and the, and what we found is that the two acupressure groups showed an immediate and very strong reduction in their fatigue levels, both the relaxing and stimulating groups did that. Whereas the usual care group was flatline. There was basically not much of a change at all going on with usual care. And then in the four weeks after acupressure, uh, the fatigue stayed down somewhat as well. So that meant that the effects were lasting longer than when they were just doing the treatment. Remember that slide I showed earlier with Donald Price, where he found that low back pain patients, when they got acupuncture, the effects persisted for days. Uh, after the needles were removed. And then for sleep here is looking at sleep. You can see that the sleep is also improved uh, with the relaxing group a bit more than the stimulating group. So that was really interesting. And um, when we looked at pain, we found also that pain was reduced. We found that the individuals that did relaxing and sham acupressure and, and stimulating acupressure had reductions in their pain, which persisted for four weeks after the treatment. And then the usual care group showed very little change uh, in their pain. So when we looked in the brains of these uh, fatigued cancer survivors and looked to see how their brains changed uh, with the treatment, uh, interestingly, we found two different signals. We found that the uh, stimulating acupressure tend to cause an increase in connectivity between the default mode network, which is your resting network, this constellation of brain areas that's involved when you're self-referentially kind of thinking about yourself and daydreaming. So this default mode network was more connected to the superior colliculus, which is more activated when you're sleeping. Um, whereas the relaxing or whereas the stimulating group had greater uh, connectivity of the default mode network to the bilateral pulvinar and the thalamus. And essentially what that was basically saying was that the relaxing acupressure was increasing a connectivity pattern that was consistent with promoting sleep, whereas the stimulating acupressure group was getting increases in connectivity to the thalamus and pulvinar, 
which was consistent with increasing alertness. Um, both of those you can think of would be uh, reducing your, your, your fatigue that you might be experiencing. You might sleep better, so you have less fatigue, or you might be more active during the day also, which would give you uh, less fatigue. So I said that there was a smartphone app uh, that we've got. We've got two of them, for one for both of those treatments, one for relaxing and one for stimulating. And this app is freely available, like I said, on Androids and Apple phones. Um, it, ar it arose from six uh, focus group meetings with over eight breast cancer survivors telling us you know, what they wanted to see in this app, what were the things that they wanted to find. And so with this app, you have the points on the body, and then there's a you can click a button and find out where on the body uh, that point is. Um, and then you can click on the, another button and you get a video of either me or Susie Zick telling you how to find that point. And then there's a timer. So we think this is a really nice uh, way to make a treatment more available to people that have less access uh, to it. Okay, so now um, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to shift to this, <laughs> which is um, kind of the you know 800 pound gorilla who's in the room that no one really wants to talk about. And so that that gorilla is basically this. Over the last 50 years of research in acupuncture, we really still don't know what constitutes an acupuncture point. I mean, this really hinders our understanding of what acupuncture is, and it also hinders its adoption by Western biomedical practices. And so uh, Dr. Helen Langevin, who's now the director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at NIH, and then Dr. Peter Wayne at Harvard, um, they published this nice article, which basically pointed the finger at this and says, you know, one recurring theme of critics is that the concept of acupuncture points has no scientific validity. Critics will say, well, if there are these points, what are they? What are you actually doing at these points? What is so specific about them? So the critics are quick to pick that up. And then meanwhile, uh, those of us in the field, we have not paid a lot of attention to whether acupuncture points exist. The research community itself has not really found, uh, found out what these points really are. So this is a really huge problem. And the way NIH, one way NIH has decided to go about trying to study that is they put out a call for uh, funding for a database. And uh, Dr. Vitaly Napadeau and Carl Helmer at NGH and, and I, we, we all put in a grant uh, called TARA, called, it's called the Topological Atlas and Repository for Acupoint Research. And what TARA is supposed to do is it's supposed to be uh, a, a, a database that's a 3D model of the human body with a point where every acupuncture point is. And you'll be able to click on the dot and find the structures around that point, the blood vessels, the lymph nodes, uh, the fascia, uh, the bone, anywhere around that point. And you'll be able to collect the data that has been done, that's been published in the field um, about those points. And so uh, Tara, is, we, we got the grant and Tara is on its way. And I'd like to tell you a little bit today about the Tara project. So um, the Tara project has the administrative core and there's these other cores, the team core, the data core, the ontology core and the Atlas core. So um, we're gonna start with the ontology core which is led by Mary and Martone. And the ontology core is tasked with describing uh, basically all of the organs in the body in the nervous system and how uh, they're labeled by acupuncture points. So an ontology is essentially a list of factors in a system. And so these factors uh, are gonna be identified by a knowledge graph. And Dr. Martone is experienced in doing this. She's done this for the SPARC database. NIH is very keen on, on merging all of the databases that they fund and Tara will be merging with uh, HubMap, Spark, as well as other databases that are ongoing uh, at NIH. And so um, in order, one of the first things that the, uh, the ontology group had to do and is in, still in the process of doing is soliciting uh, use cases, which essentially are basically um, the questions that a user would ask of uh, the system. And so 
um, the, the ontology is going to define every single acupoint uh, on all the meridians, as well as 40 of the extra points. And it's going to be uh, labeling structures, not just by Western biomedical terms. The ontology will also include uh, traditional East Asian medical terms like chun and chi and blood. Um, so there's other terms that will also go into the ontology. And we were, we were tasked to do that by, by NIH. The Atlas core is really cool. So the Atlas core is going to develop this three three dimensional um, body map, which I was talking to you about. And this body map has all of the internal organs aligned in it. And what's going to happen is uh, Peter Hunter, Dr. Peter Hunter, who's from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, he's done um, this Atlas for the Spark group. And so we're going to be leveraging his work uh, into Tara. And on this map, um, we're going to label on two individuals every single spot on the body where there's an acupuncture point with, and we're going to label them with these markers that come up as opaque in the MRI. And so this is a picture of Dr. Vitaly Napado back in 2003 when he had this idea to do this. And now we're funded in 2024 now um, to, to look at the, the body. And so um, this is this right here is stomach 36 on the skin. Um, and so this is the marker that we'll be picking up with the MRI. So these MRI, these MRI models will be um, merged with the computer 3D set. And then there's a one millimeter thickness cryosection data set from Korea, which we're going to introduce as well, so that every acupoint will be able to be identified, not just by um, kind of this cartoon map. Um, you can click on the dot and then find the cryo section of that 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 point and find the structures that are around that so that's the atlas group the data core group is involved in actually collecting all the data and um, the data core group is headed by uh, dr carl helmer and there's working groups um, as well as the data repository and the data access advisory committees um, you'll recognize Dr. Shanna Louie from the University of California at Irvine. She's involved in in these in one of these uh, advisory committees, and um, we're they're basically informing what data should go into Tara. So it has to be data that's quant that's quantifiable and scientifically rigorous, and then the database will have to have access so that people can get that data and uh, use it as they want to uh, on their own. So you can see this, this database is going to be highly useful, not just for acupuncturists in the field, but also you know, neurophysiologists that happen to be working on the median nerve that's near pericardium six. You know, maybe, maybe they're doing some electrophysiology and they say, hey, wow, there's this acupoint that's right next to where I've been recording. And maybe they will uh, find benefit in that. And so this TAR is going to be um, more than just a uh, acupuncture specific device or product. Um, finally, I'm going to end with the team core. So the traditional East Asian medicine core, which is headed by me um, and Li Xing Lao, who's a um, professor at the University of Virginia, uh, integrative medicine and Laura Triplett, who's the executive director of SAR. Um, we're all heading up the working group and we have an advisory committee that uh, informs us about uh, team aspects. So the team core is essentially ensuring that the data core, the ontology core, and the Atlas core are all infused with aspects of traditional East Asian medicine. So things like the acupuncture points, the meridians, what they're used for, what diseases they're used for, et cetera. Um, we're also tasked with talking to the clinical community, the scientific community, um, where we're kind of, we're collecting information from our members, uh, individuals throughout the world, that want to use Tara and we're trying to figure out what um, they might want. And so that's the first activity that the Tara team core has been doing is we've been doing a community survey to see the these use cases, like I said, in the ontology, a use case is essentially what a user would ask uh, for Tara. So in order for Tara to be useful, we need to make sure that we're making it in such a way that the users themselves would uh, want want to get uh, interaction with this device. So we we emailed over three thousand five hundred subscribers uh, in our in our 
in the S Society for Acupuncture Research's database. Um, we've posted on social media. Uh, we've sent out uh, information to organizations that are involved in acupuncture. And then we also have these global ambassadors. Uh, we have 17 people from 17 different countries throughout the world that are our, our global ambassadors, which spread the word and give us uh, information. They're kind of like the ear of that country and let us know what that country is doing. So we, we contacted our global ambassadors to uh, send out our survey. And so our survey results came from largely practitioners, which is not surprising. Uh, about 70% of the individuals that responded were practitioners. So far, we've um, we've got 180 responses right now. This data has just been tabulated for the first 115, and we're and we're still ongoing. So if you want to give us information about Tara and what you would like to see in Tara, um, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll I'll connect you. Um, so anyway, our first survey has listed a lot of practitioners. About 18% were researchers and practitioners, so they identified as being a researcher as well as a practitioner. We had a few students, and then we had a few just plain researchers, and then we had uh, one teacher so far. So interestingly, the use cases basically um, uh, fell into six major domains. Uh, tissue structure and function was like the main one. This is individuals were interested in what uh, tissues and structures were around where the acupoint was. They were wondering um, what, what organs and body parts were around where the points are. So that was that's good to know that a lot of the people were wanting to know that. Interestingly, 22% of the individuals wanted to know safety information. They were concerned that maybe the acupoints would be close to a specific internal organ like the lung, and they were curious about how safe uh, acupuncture was. And so Tara might be able to give someone information on that. Um, the next prevalent uh, use case was disease points. So these individuals were asking essentially uh, what kind of diseases do uh, these points, are these points used for? Um, another group of individuals were interested in diverse practices. So we're not interested, we're, they weren't interested in just say Chinese acupuncture, they were interested in acupuncture in Japan as well as Korea and throughout the world. 9% um, of the individuals were interested in mechanisms, like what does the needling at stomach 36 do to uh, neurotransmitter Y or hormone X or brain region? So that was a mechanisms type uh, use, use query. Um, and then interestingly, we didn't think about this when we wrote Tara, but actually some of the individuals were interested in sham locations. And so that's one of the bugaboos in the field is that we don't really know uh, where sham points are. We don't, we don't have a defined structure uh, or map to tell us which points are inert. And so Tara might be able to help in that respect as well. I just want to end with a couple um, slides here which show some of the actual responses of individuals uh, in these basically use case themes. So in the tissue theme, um, this individual is saying, I'd like to know which nerves are close to the acupoints. I want to know if I'm slightly off the right point, what will happen. Uh, this individual is interested in nerves and fibers, underlying structures, arteries, et cetera. Um, the third person's neurovas neurovas muscular junctions, arteries, veins, lymph nodes. So a lot of these people were interested in the tissues. Uh, the safety individuals were, you know, talking about what, what are the dangerous points out there? Um, how far can I puncture and be safe? What's the recommended depth of needling? What's the recommended angle of needling? The diverse practices group, uh, this individual said, you know, what are the different acupuncture practices throughout the world? Japanese, Chinese, Korean. Um, the disease acupoint group, uh, here's a comment, someone saying that they would like to know the best acupoint combinations for specific diseases. Um, the mechanism group, uh, this individual was basically saying, tell me what the influence of X brain region and, and structure is when I needle that point, uh, what's the influence on the body. Um, and then what's interesting is that we also got a number of compliments from the, from the community. Um, this one, this person says, you know, Hey, just want to say thank you, people. This is a humongous effort that will be a massive leap forward for acupuncture. Um, this person says, I will probably use this tool constantly. I think that's really interesting. And I'm really happy to see 
that there are some individuals that are looking forward to, to using Tara. But as a cautionary note, we also got uh, some, some individuals uh, expressing some concern. And this one I've still been thinking about, and it's kind of keeping me awake at night a bit. This, this person's saying, I'm concerned that you might reinforce the notion that acupoints are fixed anatomical entities, thus undermining the more useful awareness that they are fluid phenomenon manifesting differently in different patients, practitioners, and circumstances. So I get it. You know, the points may be fluid, and Tara is flexible enough to address that. We might be able to find that what pe when people are calling stomach 36, you know, in one publication, it's not the same location as someone calling stomach 36 in another publication. So we might be able to get at these points being fluid and dynamic. All right, so I'm going to end by saying uh, in the summary, there's um, three basic types of pain mechanisms. So back to the beginning of my talk, we have nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociplastic, and all three mechanisms may be operative in any one patient, making it really complex to study. Interestingly, acupuncture and acupressure can both reduce probably all three of these types of pain, but we haven't really determined which points or how to specifically treat a patient that says, let's say they have more nociceptive pain than nociceptive pain. What are the points you use? The researchers haven't done that. The researchers have not really, and I'm guilty of this, we haven't really uh, differentiated what type of pain pathway we're trying to treat with acupuncture. I presented some data today saying that acupuncture and acupressure both can change the central nervous system, um, but hey, we don't really know what an acupuncture point is, and that's a huge problem. And it's a huge opportunity for us to uh, move the field forward to identify our weaknesses and uh, to to learn to get us to learn more about what's going on. And I think Tara may help, um, but obviously we need your help too. So if you're interested in Tara, I hope you use it when when we eventually come out with it, and um, we hope that it 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 helps the field. Uh, I just want to say a shout out. Obviously, the research that I've done um, was not just me. I've been a part of a larger group at the University of Michigan, as well as now at the University of California, Irvine. Um, Ishtiak Maula here is the grad student who did a lot of that neuroimaging research. And then uh, Dr. Susie Zick here is my colleague who's done a lot of the acupressure uh, um, research studies. And we've obviously been very lucky to be awarded grants. This U24 is the TARA grant. And then I've had RO1s as well as um, Department of Arm Army funding, as well as foundations funding for doing my research. And I'll put a shout out to Dr. Dan Claw down here in the lower right, who's been a really strong colleague of mine and helped me over many, many years of discussions. And I just wanna say thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and obviously this, this talk is coming from Orange County and uh, the Tongva and Aksha men tribes have lived in Orange County for many years before the present day. Um, and so I want to just pay homage and honor, honor them and their, and, uh, their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. That was an amazing talk. And uh, certainly thank you for going into depth. And it, you know, it certainly is uh, breathtaking, and I think it'll be a tour de force, uh, really pushing acupuncture research and practice forward by leaps and bounds. So um, thank you for sharing some more details around that. Uh, I want to yeah. remind our audience and our attendees to please use the Q&A feature to enter some questions. Um, and let's see, we have a few here. So um, this is from Dr. Linden. Great talk from a U of Michigan alumni. Uh, have you studied the synergistic effect of acupuncture with other integrative approaches, such as meditation, biofeedback, and neurofeedback? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, that's a grant idea that I'm in the process of writing Writing a grant. I want to see if you know the combination of acupuncture plus meditation, uh, if they work synergistically. Now that we know acupuncture works on the brain, meditation also works on the brain, um, but they come at it from different angles. Like acupuncture is a peripheral treatment initially because the needle's inserted in the periphery, but it does have an effect on the central nervous system. 
And that effect, I think, is different from what meditation does. But I think they can work synergistically. And I want to see, I want to try to combine that. And I think we're now at the stage where it's fruitful for us to start pooling together the treatments that are effective and seeing, you know, which combinations are really synergistically better than each of them in isolation. And uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I think that's where the field's going. That's great. It's great to hear. I know, you know, going from just single treatments to what we really do in real life in integrative health, which is sometimes a combination and, and knowing, you know, what combinations work together and are complementary to each other. Um, the next question is a while ago, I saw a device in China that can help you find acupuncture points. You moved it around your body and will feel a sensation and it's close to or on an acupoint. Uh, they said it used electric electricity or electrical differences to locate the acupoints. What do you think about this device? Yeah, I mean, people have looked at this, uh, what's, what's called like skin resistance or electrical resistance on the skin. And then a lot of people have thought that the acupoints on the skin might be locations where there's uh, decreased resistance and increased electrical connectivity, you know, into the body. And uh, there's been a number of studies that have tried to identify points that way. And it's used clinically, it's used a lot in the ear to find the ear points. Um, I've, I've used one of those devices before I've seen them used. Um, but the field hasn't accepted that as um, a completely valid way of finding the points. It's complicated because there's a lot of factors that go into the electricity around the skin. How much, how much you sweating, the temperature of the room. Um, there's a lot of factors that need to be controlled. And uh, unfortunately, from my understanding, the clinical research and the, the, the science is not rigorously proven that those those devices are accurate, accurately finding the point. But then also the point isn't on the skin. Like the point is inside the body usually. And sometimes like far in, like, you know, centimeters in. And so how that relates to what's going on in the skin surface, I'm not, it's not clear. So there, those two things are um, where, where we have to move forward. And maybe with Tara, um, we're, we're hoping to do electrical uh, modeling so that people can go on to TAR and say, okay, I'm going to apply electrical stimulus here on the body. Uh, what does the current look like, you know, around an acupoint? And so uh, we might be able to get some data on that. That's great. I think it's just such a salient question, right? What is an acupoint? And is it, you know, when some of us do presentations, we talk about a neurovascular enriched bundle area under the acupoint, but then, you know, is it the interstitium um, that you're really moving? And, uh, and so, you know, just as a follow-up in terms of the Terra imaging core, it's very difficult to image the interstitium. Oh, uh, actually. Oh yeah. So yeah. how are you incorporating that? <laughs> yeah. Great, great point. Um, so Dr. Langevin, who's done a lot of acupuncture research on fascia is very keen on Tara having fascia uh, in the model and in, in the in the database. And so remember that I showed that picture of Vitaly getting those markers put on his skin and then he's going to get MR, there's going to be an MR image of him. So we're going to do that with two individuals. We're going to put those markers on two individual skin for every point, for every acupoint, and then we'll do a whole body MRI and that MRI is going to be tuned to get as many structures as we can. And the fascia is a key, uh, a key network that we want to try to get with that MR imaging. And so people will be able to click on Tara, click on the point and pull up a slab of tissue that includes fascia and muscle and blood vessels, et cetera. That's great. I mean, and it sounds like it would be done. The imaging is being done on someone who's healthy, but what about imaging those who are in a disease condition where that interstitium might be disordered, right? Like a chronic pain condition. Yeah. I mean, you know, Tara wasn't designed to do that yet, but it could be a next step. Like if, if we're successful and we're able to basically just get two humans, a male and a female and show the points um, and get this database going, it could then be a platform for others to 
scan any type of condition and see see if we can add that and make a, a network of scans, you know, network of different diseases. And NIH is interested in in seeing Tara like they're thinking forward. They're they're saying, you know, if if you're successful after these first five years, what's the next step? Right. And that might be a logical next thing to try. That's great. Um, the next question, Dr. Harris, is on uh, you know, acu have you uh, seen or done any studies on comparing acu uh, pressure compared to virum acupuncture versus sham acupoints? Yeah, I I myself have not done any studies that have directly contrasted acupuncture and acupressure. They're definitely different interventions. Um, usually, you know, with acupuncture, you, you go in and you get a treatment and you may get like six to eight treatments over the course of a month or two, and then you see how you're doing. Whereas with acupressure, you, you, what we've done is you you do the acupressure at home, you, and then people are doing longer stimulations. Like in our studies, we did 30 minutes of pressure. Usually when you do needling, you're not, unless you're getting electro acupuncture, you're not getting stimulation the whole time. Um, so there's a lot of variables that are need to be controlled for so that there's no confounding effects. If you're going to actually test whether needling is different from acupressure is different from sham, so um, I've not done that yet. I know there's a there's a number of studies that have looked at that, um, but to my knowledge, they haven't really compared apples to apples. It's more like they're looking at needling done, you know, once a week for four weeks versus acupressure done daily at home. So it's 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 a challenge to figure out, and that's the field doesn't even know what the right dose is for a lot of these things. We don't know what's the approved number of treatments, the depth of the needling, the amount of pressure they apply, the duration of the pressure. Um, these are all key questions that the field hasn't really um, studied yet. I think you just hit upon the next question, which is, you know, I think maybe you could answer for the protocol that you published on, how long did uh, were participants instructed to stimulate the acupressure point? Yeah, so we had nine points uh, over the body, uh, seven, seven bilateral and two unilateral. Or, or like, no, they, we had seven points. We had nine points on the body. Eight were bilateral and one was unilateral. And we asked them to apply pressure for three minutes on each point. So they were squeezing or pressing with their, their hand. We also have this device called the AccuWand that uh, use, is used to apply pressure and it's ergonomically developed. And um, so they had three minutes on a point. So it's about half an hour almost to do the whole, the whole treatment. And so that, that is one of the drawbacks is that it, it's, it does take some time. We're not sure if three minutes is magical. And if, if six weeks of treatment is the maximal benefit, we just don't know uh, what the right dose is. We just ended up starting with three minutes a point because that's what we picked in our pilot data. That's great. Um, this next question is from Dr. Chenna Louis uh, asking how acupressure overlaps with acupuncture regarding local and central mechanisms. I was interested to see your data on acupressure and you know fMRI showing potential mechanisms. Yeah, um, it's really funny. Like not many people have actually um, done that. Like there's very little acupressure brain imaging data. There's very few people who've done acupressure, but you can do it quite easily. You can put the someone in the magnet and like do pressure on their feet while they're getting their brain image. So that can definitely be done. Um, the way we did it was we did imaging before and after uh, six weeks of treatment. And so uh, our effects were a bit different than the immediate effects of pressure, but they were correlated with pain, with fatigue reduction. Interestingly, yeah, there was different mechanisms where acupressure seemed to be working on the default mode network and the connectivity of the default mode. Whereas the needling that we did with Ishtiax paper, we found the sensory cortex being a key role. Now the acupressure that we did in the cancer survivors was gentle, whereas the needling done in the fibromyalgia study with acupuncture involved a lot of electrical stimulation. And so it was quite strong. 
So um, maybe the strength of the needling might evoke different sensations. Uh, we don't know. But it seemed like acupressure was doing something different than acupuncture. Granted, they were two different patient populations, though, too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. And this is from your, uh, I think, undergrad researcher who's giving you a shout out, Jenna Azar. Uh, how do researchers address cultural biases and perceptions surrounding acupuncture when studying its effectiveness in managing chronic pain? Excellent question there. Yeah, great question, Jenna. Um, that's a topic that we're trying to address in the Society for Acupuncture Research conference that we're going to hold at Irvine in 2025. One of our symposiums is going to be a key focusing key on um, diversity and inclusion and access and how, um, at least in the U.S., there's not equal access to this intervention. And so we need to increase the access so that more and more people can get you know, these treatments, because they're clearly effective. Um, in other countries, it's more more readily accepted, obviously, like in China and Japan and Korea, it's much more easy to find an acupuncturist and get access to it. So culturally, that varies depending on the country that you're in. Um, those numbers that I threw out there by Richard Nahan's paper, 1%, which is now rose, risen to 2% of the population have used acupuncture. That's not a big that's not a big chunk of us, you know, and there's a lot of people with pain. So we do need to increase our uh, availability and access and maybe the acupressure will be e more easily adopted because people don't have to s travel to the therapist to get their treatments, et cetera. So but that's a great question, Jaina. Uh, that I think uh, finding ways to have greater impact is just really, really important. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for that excellent talk, and thank you to the attendees for your stimulating questions. Um, we really appreciated the uh, recording of this webinar will be up on our website and a link will be sent to you. Thank you again and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.